Maybe like a little coffee? I'm going to make sure I can make it. I measured it by looks. Well, I don't know. Yeah, it's pretty strong. Alright. Yeah, it's pretty strong. All right, so how many people we got here? Where, where is everybody? I was thinking there'd be like 15 or so. So two, four, six, eight, nine. Let me switch this off. Yeah, I'll turn it on. Who's the other uh, Ohio? Ohio? Yeah. Uh, where are you from? The sweet ones. Damn. What about you? Uh, Madison, uh, near King. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So see if that works. Ken, try to try to see if we can log in. Okay. Um. But people, I think you can hear me. So, where is everybody? Let's start. Welcome. Paradise. You'd never think this would look like this. <laughs> so it's permanently under construction for probably for the next five years. I'm Marchin, the founder of Open Source Ecology. Um, been at it on this plot, plot right here since 2006. So just for perspective, we build all the infrastructure here. The, this was an empty soybean field when we started. We built this this house. One this of the house, first, house. This was one of the first. This was one of the first. Yeah, let's see. Testing, testing. So we can probably go down. This one we can probably turn down all the way. Turn the volume down on this thing. So, hey, Marchin, while we're doing uh, AV oh. stuff, I think we're looking at the wrong screen. Also, let's try it again. So, what I what I did want to start with is actually introductions, so brief introduction. But as far as the workflow uh, that comes today in this program, this is the first day of the SummerX program. The next three months, it's literally back to back builds, all kinds of things. Some people are staying. About nine people are going to be staying for the whole time, the very whole time. Most people are leaving after um, the first month. The first month's kind of busy. So, uh, but yeah, it's going to be a lot of exciting builds. I mean, what I look forward to is building more stuff faster, better, stronger than ever before. Like the house, I mean, we should have a really good workflow on that. Building larger and more interesting 3D printers, next generations of the tractor. Aquaponic Green has a lot of, a lot of stuff coming up. So I really look forward to it. A lot of the experimentation, but I do want to invite you to, to the idea. This is all collaborative. It's open source, absolutely open source collaborative. And um, it's really the people that come here, both on site and remote. I mean, that's who makes it happen. And what happens in this event is up to us. It's, uh, so what I'll try to do is share as much as I know about what we have learned today about collaborative design, how you do large collaborative efforts for both on a design front and on the build front. So we've learned a lot about that through, through history. Um, I'll, I'll do like a little bigger presentation on OSC just just a little while, but let's maybe, um, let's share just as an intro, who we are, what our main goals are for the time we're here. So my main goal is to get the CD Cajon to product release to something that we can build for customers readily, uh, thousand square feet, hundred thousand dollars as a turnkey build package that we provide to people. Now, in order to do that, we have to be lean and efficient. So part of it is really making the design super effective, very easy to build, so that you can see like what is this possible for you to do? I want to know here. Um, like in the, over the last two months, we've been building the version two. Now we're on three. We're actually changing some things, making it even easier. Because we learned, we had uh, a lot of the people in the internship were pretty much novice, and that that taught us further that man, okay, we need to 
simplify even more, make it uh, more effective, just conceptually simpler. And we are doing all that. So I want to really see how we can get that to, so anybody can build, deliver on a promise. It's uh, promise right now is 500 hours for a house. So what's that mean? Well, if it's 50K, it's 50K in materials. Uh, the model that we're looking at right now is if we sell these, then OSC operations, we get like 25K out of that and we can pay about 25K in labor, something to that effect. That's kind of like the general revenue model figure. But if 500 hours for 25K, 50 bucks an hour, I mean, that's our goal for what we can definitely do. And if you do management, if you become an entrepreneur doing this, I mean, you can make more or you can be just a builder. Uh, but it does require some skill to do that. Like if you're going to get to that $50 level, it's it's skill. Uh, but yeah, we'll see how far we can get on that. So I really look forward to what we can do. Just uh, probably learn mo more than anyone else here because <laughs> I really suck things up. And today we're going to get right in, right in there. So at 10, we actually have a concrete truck coming. So we're going to cut out at 9.30 to get ready. Okay, so brief introduction. I'll do a brief intro on OSE. So yeah, let's go around, see who we've got here, take some notes. Oh uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Matty uh, from Minneapolis. Uh, been doing uh, civil engineering here for a few years, and just kind of got burnt out and was looking to do something else, and so I tried to come down here and uh, get this go. What's your goal for this? Like, what, what are you look, really looking forward to learn? Um, I guess you see see the process and whatnot. Uh, uh, largely, I guess, just kind of get out of the office, uh, get a little more physicality again. I've been mm -hmm. kind of doing a whole lot of nothing here for a few years, and uh, uh, it'd be nice to, to, to not just be a, an office person for a second. All right. Okay. I'm Logan from Cedar Rapids, Iowa. So my goals are kind of twofold. Uh, I've been following OSC for a while, and I'd like to contribute, and it's a little bit hard without seeing things, at least for me, in, the, in person. And so I think. Having seen Eco Home will help me visualize things a little bit better so mm -hmm. I can help more. And then I'd also, I'm considering building one at some point in my life. I don't have land yet, but uh, if I find it's a doable goal to do it myself, then uh, that becomes tangible reality. And uh, I'm an electrical engineer back home. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm Ted. I work for the UN in Vienna. I uh, have zero technical skills, so I'm a good test case for your novice person mm -hmm. coming in who knows nothing. Yeah, this is doable. Yeah, and I like where to build a house. Yeah. Where's your son? He's not doing that. Okay. Okay. He's here. Okay. That's cool you're doing it as a son, father. Yeah. That's really cool. My name is Joseph. I'm a music teacher in Portland, Oregon. Um, I'm primarily interested in hopefully building a house of my own at some point. Um, I've been following the OC for some years just on the internet, and um, my wife demanded that I come and see if the houses could be uh, fashionable. <laughs> so that's one of my primary missions. <laughs> okay. So Sorry, uh, could somebody else take over this? Because uh, I can't get it. So okay. Get, uh, more hey, so. Can somebody maybe plug in? Because I, I want to do the yeah, presentation so. so you can all view it. Let's see if we can plug in. My name is Anthony. I'm a I manage a cybersecurity team out of uh, um, well the the cyber team's out of Chicago, but I'm in Ohio now. Um, do you want? Yeah, just plug it in so you can see my screen. Uh, so you're actually broadcasting. If you tune into the Zoom, oh god, did you get the Zoom link? No, I didn't. I didn't get the check. Check the email. You should be in there. Yeah. Um, Oh yeah, so uh, I'll just do this real quick. Uh, so I manage a cybersecurity team. Basically, uh, after George Floyd and um, COVID, uh, I was working, uh, and it just didn't seem to make sense. The type of work I was doing, kind of like, uh, you know, I need to actually learn how to build something to provide a different type of value for working people from where I'm from. So. Um, open source is the, the future. Decentralized open source is the future. Uh, I know that in my field, um, and you guys can probably see it coming in different pipes down in your own areas. So this is about banging on the banging on the wheels and figuring out. I actually don't have any experience with houses um, since I started last year, and then I bought two, renovated them, and I'm going to build one from scratch to see if how 
good I am at that and, uh, you know, what it actually requires before I start, you know, planning on starting a business. And then I'm going to start a business that's going to do um, replicable replicable homes in some type of fashion with a, a method of automation in a, in a factory, as well as a component that's built on site, how those two um, flow. I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of looking forward to figuring out. Yeah. So are you considering making that model business model open source as well, or it, it absolutely will. The, um, the company is called victory homes. I just finally got the domain um, just a week ago. So, I now own Victory Homes and Victory Homes Limited, as well as um, got a lawyer working on whatever I have to do to make sure people can't use the name. And then, uh, so that's that's the basic premise. The basic premise is a Victory Home, like a Victory Garden. When we, uh, the last time we were in a Great Depression, Victory Gardens were a way that we could uh, do it on our own. So the the hope is to, in a new era, inspire that same type of vision of doing it yourself. Um, and I know open source is the, the, the path to that. It's just about us all getting together and figuring out the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. So cool. it's fine. All right. Okay. Uh, I got to get my job. Yes. Of course. Hey, everybody. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. My name is Eric. Um, background is in software development, bit of software street as well. Um, so this past year, I've been doing freelance software dev, and that contract wrapped up. Um, or more accurately, I wrapped it up because I was interested in open source ecology. Um, so yeah, really excited to be here. My goals, I'd say, first and foremost, is to meet interesting people. Um, so far, that goal's been going well. Um, and then additionally, contribute. I think that that's also high up there in the sense that I definitely definitely see the open source model of it is what you make it. So how mm -hmm. it can be useful, um, you know, by all means, let me know. Especially technical questions, software stuff, be able to run it by me. Um, and that kind of looking at Looking at pivoting away from the software dev for me specifically, or looking at other careers, maybe tangential to, or even you know completely different from computer science. Um, and so I think open source college is just a, a cool opportunity in that sense, and that you have a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds with a lot of different skill sets, and kind of see what interests me. Mm -hmm. um, and open to open to the entrepreneurial side as well. So I've, I've done some startup work with software, um, learned a lot of lessons, and you know, we'll, we'll definitely be open to sort of the more business side as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Hi, I'm Evan. I live in Austin, Texas these days, and I um, worked in software for a long time. I used to do framing um, as a younger, stronger guy. So I'm uh, looking forward to doing some more building and seeing how this compares to what you call onto on a normal job site and how that. I work for people. Um, I own a small, close to falling down house in Portland, Oregon, and um, now I have a family, and uh, I've been thinking about maybe trying to take that down for something else better, better in place, and maybe um, this house will be it. So we can both find out whether it's fashionable and will work for wives. Uh -huh. <laughs> curves. No angles, always curves. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've done too much carpentry. There's a reason why people don't make build with curves because it's fucking hard. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Ken. My name is Ken. Uh, I come from Botswana, but I live in Indonesia at the moment. Um, I was uh, an aircraft engineer until last year when I lost my job and um, then because of COVID. Uh, so I've been following open source. And probably for a while since the 80s because I had interest in um, building with uh, CVs. So um, my goal is to try and make a business out of um, the open source machines, uh, uh, open source uh, equipment, and uh, uh, try and make a living out of it. Introductions, Jeff, say. Tell us who you are and why you're here. Uh, I'm Jeff Higdon. I'm from Texas, Louisiana, Alabama, Oklahoma, Idaho, and North Dakota. But I live in North Dakota, but uh, I moved here from North Dakota. I live in North Idaho, and I took the Jeff Lawton permaculture course in, I can't remember what year. And uh, I thought, hey, I really like this. 
I started following the stuff here in 2017. I came out on the Walker Tractor Build, and that was a blast. So I've been kind of following along since then. So the marching asked me to come out and help, so I came out in June. So a lot, a lot of fun stuff here. So I yeah. in the, the micro house here. So, so is Curtis coming? Because uh, yes, uh, is, the road was blocked off. Oh, so that's what I was stepping in here for to see if he was here, and I'm gonna step back out and give him a call. Okay. So do I need to have a uh, thing in here? Yeah. Or so go to your, go to your email. I'll go find. Him. Yeah, go to email. I sent an email to everybody that I yeah, should have gotten. I don't see the um, login. It's supposed to. I think you just have any login. You can just no, make I it just. Up. Uh, oh, okay. And then you use that uh, Zoom link to get in there. Yeah, so if you go to your, no, I think you just click in. Oh, I don't know. Do you have to log in? Yeah, yeah I don't have any. Okay. All right. Um, That's a thick book you got there. Yeah. And on the remote side, uh, does anyone want to introduce themselves as well? Sure. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm Solomon Kemo from Zimbabwe. I work for the University of Zimbabwe. Uh, our goal is uh, to be part of the 3D printing sessions, and we also eventually want to set up our own micro factory at the university. Thank you. Yeah, so someone's participating from Zimbabwe. They got a group of four people building the printer along with us when we do it. Very cool. Welcome. <laughs> My son's name is Solomon. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Matt, how about yourself? Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Matt Jarman. I live in Ithaca, New York. Uh, moved here originally from Southern California. And um, I'm an organizational psychologist by training, uh, but currently starting a nonprofit. Uh, uh, and we want kind of to have like a replicable uh, kind of sustainable uh, house that we can build uh, for affordable housing and as a source for revenue for the nonprofit. Um, and uh, right now I'm exploring natural building options and how uh, we might apply some of what we're doing for the CD go home to, uh, to building with uh, natural materials such as straw and cob. Um, so just exploring uh, kind of those options and excited, excited, excited to meet you all. Yeah. Hello. Um, real quick, uh, the computer audio. Do you want to test this before we get feedback, or um... no? I, we're, I think we're good because I'm recording on here, so okay. we're good. We're good. Uh, James, who are you? Hey, everybody. I'm burnt out software guy number four. I think mm -hmm. uh, last time I was uh, counting cybersecurity guy number three. I suppose. Uh, I've been a big fan of the open source ecology for a little while now, like a few other people here, and I am trying to see what tools there are to help me get out of the rat race. That's about it. Yeah. All right. Um, cool. So, yeah, well, thanks everybody for a brief intro. And uh, what we plan on doing is in the morning every day, we will go through some design work, but here today is intro day and we got to cut out at 9.30. So definitely by 9.30. So little, just a little bit more intro on, on basically my, my background on this. So I actually come from Poland. And when, when I came 
out of Poland. This was 1982. Man, these tanks were rolling down my street. So that's a real that's a real scene. That's what I've seen there. And uh, it was martial law behind the Iron Curtain. Had to wait in line for food and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, kind of hard times. And I moved to America. It was great. You know, <laughs> easy life. The shelves filled with like hundreds of each item, whereas you'd have to wait in line and be like one one bread, like vinegar and one butter and <laughs> Like when you saw this diversity of like say the yogurt shelf or like a hundred brands, I was like crazy. What's this? Anyway, um, life was easy, I guess. Went up to the PhD in physics, discovered I was useless because the farther I went, the more I was getting focused on not seeing the connection of how everything works together in a more integrated sense. And that's why I, that's when I started thinking about open source because uh, even in my group, I could not talk openly about what I was doing. And I was like, man, isn't that crazy? Like, I'm at an educational institution. And I could see clearly that that's getting in the way of my education. And I started thinking, well, why are we so competitive or why, why are we not openly collaborating? And started get, getting really into that question to formulate the concept of open source ecology uh, where we can do things in a, in a different way. So we started out in this parcel of land. This is where we are. That's open source hardware. That's the, that's the lot we're at. We're at. <laughs> we're on. And that's the soybean field that was there initially when we started. And in the, con in the concept of open source, kind of the evolution is, you know, what happened with open source, this idea of collaboration and software happened because people said, oh, it's actually easier if you share code and the person doesn't have to write all those lines. And then open hardware kind of, came about and it's a very nascent thing. It's maybe we're like in a baby steps of it. We still haven't gotten much further than um, I would say like the er super early days of open source software where it wasn't even on a map and companies weren't supporting it, which is like 1991, like when Linux announced his kernel. Um, soon after that, like within a year, he was very, very deliberate to say, okay, uh, minimum viable product, let's do it. They did it, it exploded, but hardware is so much harder. It's like, I actually think it's about a thousand times harder. It's not like 10 X, hundred X. I think it's like a thousand even because um, every change costs. It's like, if you do have to do a build, uh, I think it's really comparable to, since we got a bunch of software people here, it's really comparable to every bug fixed is a prototype. Now, if you get smart about it, you can do what's known as test driven design where you take a small section of the problem and you just solve for that. So you design for tests, module-based design, you break things into modules like in software, and then you can go try actually do it effectively. And those are the kind of things we're, we're talking about, how to do effective prototyping when it costs so much to do it in, in real life. How do you do it? So formulated the concept of open source ecology that was back way back in uh, 2004 and talking about open source society. What is the next thing? How do we create an economy in which people actually collaborate on product development, which does not exist? Like a lot of people might think, oh yeah, we're collaborative, we share. Well, no, I mean, the patent system is the core of life, trade secrets. And you can think about it, it's like, man, that is so crazy because it's a way to, I always call it, that's really enforcing mediocrity because even in school, you cannot learn the most recent stuff. Typically it's proprietary. You don't learn the best. You then end up getting sucked up in some company and then you might learn it, learn it, but then you keep it secret. So what's this all about? It's like when you think about it, start thinking about it, it's like, man, that is so inefficient. And now problems are bigger. You know, the whole world is connected. Environmental issues or social issues of equity you still haven't solved the, I, the concept of distribution in the economy. Right. Well, let's solve it. Let's solve housing. Let's solve food. Let's solve energy. Let's solve all these problems by collaboration. And that's clearly Anthony, you're saying it's common, open source is common, but it's, it's kind of slow because uh, I think the main deal is we're, we're about 200 years of industrial history since the Industrial Revolution started in the 1800s, 1700s. Um, it's always been proprietary, even though, uh, yeah, yeah, since, since about 200 years. We've got 200 years, welcome. Um, just went through introductions, we're starting on, on a presentation. But the 200 years of proprietary history, I think, right now makes it very hard for that culture to 
enter in the mainstream. Whereas in software, I guess people were used to it. The idea, at least people heard of it, the idea that people shared in software, because originally software started open. Um, is that true? Like, did it originally yeah. start open? I mean, uh, well, for, well, I mean, it was developed, like, if you're talking about, like, machine code, the original stuff, it was actually kind of a mix, right? The IBMers or there were some large scale manufacturers. It could have been open source because they could have shared it because it just didn't exist at the time. But it, it wasn't important enough to be proprietary. But as soon as it was, it, it snapped. Yeah, but even go before that, I, I'd say like 1950s, 60s, MIT. Like, wasn't that? It was the, hard to make that open or shut because it was so much effort to do any kind of programming. But right. I can, you know, if you, once, if you don't even have a keyboard and you're actually setting, setting dip switches to, to yeah, program, right. it's hard to be like, I'll take a picture of this and show you a picture. Yeah. That picture. Well, and I think like military use as well. Like after late 40s, early 50s, computers were in the domain of military and photography, as far as I understand it. Um, yeah. But also a lot of heavy math. So from that standpoint, I think the people that wanted computers were mathematicians who wanted really big log tables and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but definitely the concept of open has been well known. But if you study history too, open source did exist even though it was 200 years ago. So if you actually look at the, actually have a graph on that later. Um, but if you look at the history of the steam engine, how what happened when Watts patent ran out, innovation actually doubled and the efficiency doubled at that point. So you can argue, oh, okay, well, that's related to open source. If you do, if you do uh, study it pretty carefully, yeah, it, it was the open sharing of information they published in a the journal. They didn't have the wiki at that time, so it was a little slower, but still, that it, it it was a good example, uh, but a rare one because most, because um, just about anything did become proprietary. So we started to build on this open parcel of land. We discovered that things actually, you know, yeah, you can open source the code for machines. How do you build them? So if you can build it for yourself, why not open source it, publish it, uh, put it into CAD? At that time, actually, FreeCAD hardly existed. Like, it wasn't really good at that time, so didn't really have CAD at that time. Um, but yeah, started designing and publishing everything online. Uh, replication have happened. We've learned that people can replicate from that data. This is actually in Peru. Um, a group built some tractors there. This is a replication in um, Pasadena, Pasadena in California. Um, yeah, things, things do happen. Uh, but what is open hardware? It can apply to anything from tractors to 3D printers. That's our older version of our printer uh, to satellites, CubeSat, um, open source drones. Uh, this is an open source laser cutter called LaserSore. Uh, our tractors and, and aquaponics and houses like that's that's the CD Go Home one. We'll, we'll do a little tour of this. That's that's the first version. We've been building and improving that ever since. It, it does, I think, it would pass the wife test because my wife is is the manager. Uh, I manage the the rocket spaceship takeoff down here. Uh, it's kind of messy. Um, but um, the fundamental question we're trying to solve is this one. It's this is this question that 85 of the world's richest people have as much wealth as the 3.5 billion at the bottom of the pyramid. And I actually changed a little. That actually went to like nine or something, like in the last few years. Like it's crazy. So with industri with the industrial revolution, the open source revolution in software, in the internet age, still distribution of wealth is not questionably happening, um, because there's also the concentration from large companies that are uh, sucking up, basically gobbling up the open source and building proprietary stuff on it. Um, so the promise of open, like that liberatory promise, in my view, has not really happened. And the distributive, what we t call the distributive economy, this idea that everyone has access to wealth now, it's not there yet. But it's close because you only need so much effort to get there. You know, you need to open source it once, create a community behind it, and then it lives forever. So coming here, you're becoming immortal. Like you're becoming part of something that lives forever. I mean, psychologically, that's awesome. And that's how we should think. We think about it like that. We think, okay, how do we solve bigger problems together? I don't have to carry that cross on my shoulders. It's people are, that are gonna help out. 
And part of my growth has been a lot about, yeah, learning truly what it means to collaborate and, and not feeling like, I don't feel like I have the pressure to save the world. It's like, no, we're going to do it. That's, that's how I think about it. So it's quite liberatory in, in the mindset itself on that. So what are the milestones so far? So we've learned some crazy things about extreme, what we call now extreme manufacturing. So for example, this was the first ever one day build of the brick press. We built that whole thing, a 1,600 pound machine with 12 people in a single day. Now we stayed up pretty late. It took us till midnight, <laughs> uh, but we proved it. It was like, holy cow, this is amazing. If you uh, do smart design, do it simple. You have to have some support like so that was the small team that did it. Um, you have to have IKEA style fabrication diagrams, just really good documentation so people know how to do it. We had this kind of stuff. Um, you have to have a team workflow and stuff like that. Here's uh, building one of the early micro, micro houses where Jeff, Jeff lives there now, but we started with little uh, 144 square units. Um, and we're getting back to like the, the goal is to get the, the CD go home in CB by next year like right now we're just cranking out the stick built version because it's much easier this is much harder this you got you're working with earth heavy earth moving equipment and the brick press uh, but we're optimizing for that we're up still optimizing this the next step being the soil pulverizer because the main thing here is about uh, processing soil vast amounts of soil like tons and tons per hour like this machine here could do like 500 or so bricks um an hour Yep. Have the, any other novel materials been uh, tried to be fabricated, like hemp or? No, we, we haven't bamboo, played with that. Like that. There's a whole range of stuff that can be done, geopolymers, novel right. concretes. We've been talking about solar concrete. If you have solar energy, you can heat the gravel here, which is limestone, and turn it into concrete. You could do a lot of stuff with open technology in a distributed way. So uh, basically, uh, the idea is take all the resources of this parcel of land and create civilization from scratch from it using modern technology that's not a big deal it's you, but we can't do it yet we don't have the know-how like we haven't built for example an induction furnace or maybe say the the solar concrete maker we haven't done it it's not too hard but each one of those as i mentioned is takes a lot of effort it's like you can save perhaps a million bucks per product you can probably generalize like the 50 different machines a million bucks if you kind of did it in a corporate setting, you might get away with a million and for the first product that then starts bootstrapping itself. But it does take a bit of time. And as I mentioned, um, every every bug is cost you. That oh that was the that was the first C B home that's covered there with cladding. Uh, the bricks that we used weren't stabilized there. That's the current version. Now we added onto this. This actually looks better than this. Uh, we'll take a take a look at that. That was a build in uh, in 2016, 50 people in five days for the house, and then five days for the aquaponic greenhouse in the back, 50 people. So the, the swarming part works. That's the micro track. You can actually see it out there. We are using this. We actually shortened the track so it could turn easier. Um, wait, but what is what is all this stuff? Yeah, so I, I'm talking about the first rev, first model. No. Oh, I don't know what I'm talking about. So let's keep going here. Let's talk about modular breakdown which is one of the key enabling features of how you how you do this stuff so uh in order to cut down the costs you can and th that's the way we do it actually so you, so you know how we do this but we have a whole taxonomy there's 50 machines in a set uh we break each down into like a dozen modules we develop each one you can develop go through all the product development steps from concept to technical to cad to bills of materials to fabrication to testing and all that and you can go at the module level that's cool. That's it works. That's how software did it. I mean, modular breakdown and the ability to document that's um, version control. That's some of the keys that made it in, in software. And the same applies here. It's a, you can say it's a close parallel right there. So do yeah. you, so uh, everything that we collaborate on gets uh, reviewed peer reviewed and then approved to, to go out and do yeah. the open source community? It's, it's even looser than that. It's like the wiki is there so anyone can edit it right now. Just log in and you can edit it. But if you want to make meaningful contributions, you have to understand a little bit about the process. Like um, you have to understand several aspects like taxonomy, like 
first of all, what are we calling the machines? How, how do we version right. it? What are the development steps? But if you know that, you can say, for example, CB press V21.10, which is going to be October when we're going to build it. That's the version name. Then you can say CAD. Okay, CAD is one of the development steps. Type it in on a wiki, it, it's going to pop up. If it doesn't, make it pop up. You can do redirect. It's like, it's a very loose thing. And we save the commit to the very, very end. We, we are not locking down. It's actually more decentralized than uh, software because in software, you typically have project teams and you've got the, the master guy taking care of the master branch. Here, we allow all the branches to live because everybody who builds it, like say another guy, this guy, this green guy built it. He's going to do maybe some other different things. So we actually treat every single build as a fork. So it gets its own documentation. So you just copy the, all the former stuff from, from before because something is going to be different. You do not have, like if you make the software metaphor, a uniform compiler. Uh, people build it differently. They have different tools. They might get different materials. They might make substitutions for parts. Therefore, each build is quite unique. If Ken does it in Indonesia, he's going to have different part sourcing. Maybe he uses bamboo frames or whatever. Um, so we treat that. We let it live. So we save the reconciliation of, of the final commit to the very end. And the person who's got authority for that is really the builder. So you can't really have some kind of a commit master. Who's that? What's that called? The, who's the guy who controls all the commits? The Project the lead team or lead, or yeah, yeah. team lead, the team lead, like the individual and authority at the very end is the guy who built it because then he gets data. They see if it's buildable. I mean, a lot of authority comes from that person and whoever builds it can then go on a wiki. Okay, here's my version, all the documentation. So we encourage everybody to, to document. Uh, keep a work log. If you, for example, know like can log, march and log on a wiki, you'll see like all the stuff that we do. But you do have to get used to a little bit of this, like, okay, the taxonomy part. How do you, what do you call things? Like very basic stuff. And there's a whole, we can go into a whole lesson on that. We will. Uh, what do you call things effectively? Anything that anybody in the world does within five seconds, you can pull it up on a wiki. So you have to get that, get the concept of how you do that in your head. It's not particularly hard. Um, and you can actually make sense of the, I mean, the wiki is a big mess. It's got a lot of stuff in, in there, but if you, if you understand the navigation of it, you can actually track down any piece of information. Like you want the bill materials for Curtis, your printer from a few years ago. Well, we can go D3D um, Pro V, what I, what I think it was like version 19 or whatever it was. I forget what it was. 1904, something like that. And then you can say um, CAD and it'll pull up the CAD for that version. Because we, I mean, every, every build is a fork. It's like every time we iterate, we haven't really frozen much. We, I mean, we, we have product releases, like for example, the 3D printer, uh, we sell the brick press. Um, we haven't sold the house yet. We, we aim to do that the first one in December. Uh, but yeah, we, we continue developing. And then we can freeze branches. You can say, okay, this is our official version. Maybe we sit on that and people can replicate that. And then we can uh, continue iterating on others. Okay, so that's how the cream of the group rises to the top is you, we pick the best iteration of the newest yeah. piece and then that becomes the new master for, I mean, not the master, yeah. but it would be like the new the newest iteration that's available. Yeah. Right. And it's not necessary. Yeah, it could, you could call it master, but there's a thing called genealogy. Like, for example, um, there's a page called. So one of the taxonomy items is you have to understand what genealogy is. Right. So here we've got, OK, there's 3D printer genealogy. Click on that. Well, look at all these versions There's like 20, 30. Uh, so it could be that the mat, like for example, we're at the, like the stuff in bold is the one we're actually as the main branches that we I think we sell. But there could be newer versions, or there could be older versions that work in a particular way that you like, and you actually want to build that older thing. It doesn't mean it's a bug; it's bugged. It might be something that's more appropriate for a different context, 
because we don't have a uniform compiler, right? So do you, do you see what I'm saying, the uniform compiler thing? Yeah. Um, so like at the end of the day, the, to repeat, the, the guy who builds it, you build your house, you're going to probably change stuff. Maybe, maybe not, <laughs> probably so. Um, it's never going to be the same. So yeah, you, you, you do like, you can say CD to home. Maybe you, we don't call it like, so right now we're on V3. If you build from that, you might say something like CD to home V3, or you can say like V3, like, you know, Anthony edition, whatever. Um, the trilogy. So, um, because yeah, you have to keep track of everyone because the thing that happened to our wiki initially was at first, it's like we put up all the projects, 50 of them, you've got, you know, it was all great. And then the second version happened, the third version happened. And then you, you're like, okay, so this documentation did go with the first, second or third version, you, you lose track. So you have to pretty much break, make a new documentation set for that. And it's easy, it's just copying. We set it up with this development template um, and readily start developing. Like if you wanted to, yeah, I'm not going to show that right now. I'm getting off yeah, into the details yeah. a little bit. But there are means that with open tools, you can document everything perfectly and keep track and really keep on top of what everyone on the team is doing. As long as you know who the team members are, as long as you know the, a little bit about taxonomy and the development process, as long as you know version history, like we use FreeCAD, open, openly upload everything. We like to upload readily, like as soon as we have something, we don't want to wait like till we have, oh, this is now actually publishable or like this is the working version. No, because um, that's not collaborative. Like what if you just upload it right now, someone's, someone who actually is much better than you or different than you, they'll take it and they'll do the work for you. You come back tomorrow and that thing is already done. You can move on to the next problem. That would be true collaboration that anyone has access. That's why we favor tools that are completely open, that you don't have no paywalls or no nothing blocking people from accessing information. So, and you can make various revenues, revenue models around it, such as selling brick presses. There's no competition. Like uh, the markets for what we do are very large. So it's like, we don't live in a scarcity economy where there's only this short market. No, like housing is going to be universal. 3D printers are huge, tractors are huge. Every one of these could, could lead to what we call distributed market substitution. Idea that this huge corporation now is now being replaced by a bunch of small producers that are doing it more responsibly, more innovatively. Like the business model depend, really determines how much you're gonna innovate. If you just settle down to producing like this centralized operation, you're gonna have to spend so many years producing that same thing to recoup your money, innovation stopped, all that. So. We'd like to see the context of distributed manufacturing where everyone's innovating constantly uh, with the, the flexible micro factory, flexible manufacturing, digital fabrication, small scale, multi-purpose machines, CNC machines, small operations, very diversified. They can produce just about anything and iterate like crazy. And innovation happens. That's how you start solving problems. You can't solve problems the way things work now with a centralized system. It's too slow. Um, so there are definitely advantages to, to distribute it. Uh, but look at the revenue models. Like for example, if we built a brick press, we, we did a couple of these workshops where we charge people tuition to participate in a three day immersion, kind of like what we're doing here. Also we sell the machine. So you can, you can have a viable revenue model where you, we generate 10 K in a three day workshop. Great. That works. Um, now it's hard to do this. This is not easy. Like, yeah, we can do this, but we're like the only guys that can do it right now. We got to take this um, open source torch tables, CNC files better. Like we don't have a, like a full build guide for the latest version, really. Um, better materials. Uh, probably like we could probably simplify the design more. We haven't like revisited this since like a few good years. Um, but any of these can be turned into a viable revenue model like the 3D printer, we do workshops, for example, where 12 people show up, they build a printer in a day. We charge people 300 bucks for tuition for that day uh, on top of the materials. That's, that's what we've done a couple of, couple of times. Or this um, Dacopana greenhouse here, and that's 
that's how it looked in its prime. Right now, it's that's a Jeff's house. Like it takes maintenance to do it, um, but it's not green right now. You, you can see, it. but we'll we'll build another. And, and the next milestone on on this aquaponic greenhouse is like full like more automation, simple things that you learn. Like for example, the thing that killed this thing. Uh, so I you know I I lived with this for a year or two, a couple of years, managed it, and at the end like uh, the water start. The thing that killed it was the drips getting clogged so every day like after like a year or so i had to go up there for like 15 minutes every day just trying to unclog the things and after some time it got too frustrating and it's like okay i've got too many things on my plate so solving little things but now uh that means we're not producing food from that but this little iteration we solve that problem and then make it super robust make a revenue model around that yeah that i mean the greenhouse is the aquaponics is it is very impressive. It's it's for real. Like the that one there with the two ponds like that, they're four feet deep, two feet wide. If you actually manage the fish in there, you get three pounds of fish per day. Per day, man. That's for real. And wow. about a thousand pounds. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> that is no joke. Um Agreed. and the plants in there are you can because of the towers you got 22 plants in a square foot as opposed to one plant you can do a thousand plants per month like lettuce that's all in an 800 square foot area so man this stuff works ours is the most cutting edge there is like nobody's publishing any of this you, you can get some proprietary systems but um this is hard it's a fully integrated system you've got like praying mantises in there tree frogs and other things it's a whole ecosystem so you have to what you do pray mantises yeah we yeah we did they they the aphids Which version is that one um well yeah they would just go, go in there and whenever we we found one in nature we would put it in there and yeah and ladybugs that would other i mean bunch of stuff so but it is a complex thing that's what i'm saying like to do this for real it takes a lot of input many disciplines and it's better better than anything out there but you have to have a lot of knowledge and you have to make it super clear to people you know we for example got stuck on a thing that the thing keep clogging easy solution you know different different nozzles different pumps um but yeah that kind of stuff takes effort every time you do it okay um to document is not easy i mean who whoever documents their stuff nobody does it's it's very hard it takes a lot of time it's like twice the effort uh, we learn how to do it by collaborating with remote teams. Like, for example, when we built this iron worker machine that shears steel, we had a remote team documenting at the same time. We took pictures, we uploaded them, and then we had an instructional at the very end of the build. That's amazing. You can do things like that. That's what the internet thing can get you. Um, we found replications are possible. Um, this is a replication. and. Uh, Nicaragua, where it looks like two of our machines, uh, two pa like four, I see four power cubes in there and two brick presses. And I believe those are after our model. Uh, radical modularity, that's a big deal. That's, that's how you reduce costs. You can reduce costs by reusing parts like we use the modular tubing. Uh, we use that modular tubing in frames like for a torch table, like for this iron worker machine that can cut one by 10 inch steel. Uh, we use modular wheel units. We're going to probably build this for the tractor. This is the universal rotor. It's a heavy, uh, heavy hydraulic motor with a, we're going to use a three inch shaft. But that thing is used both like on this trencher on the front, on a wheel drive. You can run pulverizers with that. Uh, yeah. So we ended up learning how to reduce prototyping cycles from months to days. That's for real. Uh, so, for example, that's that's a great example. That's an iron worker machine. The first one, the blue one, is the first one we built. It took six months, and we stripped down to the very basics, used the modular construction technique, and built that one in two days with two people. So that's a big difference. And it could still shear that one by ten inch steel, keeping a close, a uh, very close blade gap between the, the blades. And we took it to destructive testing. We, we cut up to one by 12 before the thing belt, bent, bent up, and we disassemble it to reuse it. Um, build back hoes with the same system. So yeah, so we talk about a construction set for everything. So if, if you're gonna build a tractor, why not design a construction set of parts like here's your frames, 
here's your here's your, um, here's your drive units, power units, other units that if you have those building blocks like Legos, you can build many different things. So you can build that tractor, build a backhoe, build a bulldozer, a truck, like a Unimog style thing. Uh, so it's a construction set approach. Go ahead. Um, with that in mind, are we building with the, the modularity and design like a, uh, I forget what those things are called, like a skid steer, where you can just pop it off, pop a new one on, or is each one built from the cube and then out? You're talking about the implements on it? Yeah. The, for example, the implements, we use actually the same Bobcat quick attached with the levers, so you can put on a bucket, the forks, a pulverizer, or whatever. So yeah, it's we use awesome. all that kind of stuff. Uh, now, what I do want to mention on this too, so this definitely applies to mechanical, but it could apply to power electronics, like inverters or energy systems. It could apply to houses. That's kind of mechanical systems. I don't think there's a limit to what kind of system this applies to the construction set approach. Like, okay, if you do uh, microchips, well, you've got some basic building blocks that you do with that, and maybe you use the same or similar tools to make PV panels or something like that. Now, in the other realm, you can also talk about enterprise construction sets too. And that's kind of what we're going to try to cover in, um, in the enterprise sessions, which is how do you, how do you build up collaboratively the building blocks of any enterprise? I mean, can, can you actually break an enterprise into common elements? Okay, here's your marketing materials, here's your product design uh, elements, you know, your economic analysis, your bills of materials, like your sourcing, um, all the different things that go into an enterprise. And that also going into like sales and everything else, can we create those collaboratively in a way that if we learn how to build these things, like say the you know the 3D printer is a great example, you learn how to build that, then you also then have the enterprise construction set part, and then you can readily start a business with that. So assets such as a website template, you know, that's easy picking there. Um, various assets that we can also collaborate on. Like how would that work? Like can we do that as well? It's kind of a new topic, like people don't really think about it this way. A lot of people think, oh yeah, well, you gotta team up with your startup team and you know, you gotta get IP, you gotta work in a corner. But how about we crack that model of startup capital into this open source startup capital, which is that you have all, all this from product design to the enterprise design all open. So we'll explore that in a, through the enterprise session, how we can actually do that and maybe apply it if, there's energy for that. Apply it to actually. Okay, let's let's create a, an open enterprise this way. Go ahead. So, um, uh, one thing: uh, the best businesses in America are all built on systems. So that is absolutely 100% true. Uh, think about McDonald's. Just like sure. How about uh, and uh, this this uh, scaling the enterprise. So that is the big question uh, with my open source project for Victory Homes. It's basically going to be uh, a home that we give you every single inkling to build, kind of like we're going to do here. However, there will be models, right? You can get the support model where we'll be available at any time, day or night, to, and we'll get a revenue stream from that. You get us to actually build it for you, which will be a revenue stream, or you could get some type of mixture of both, Sure. right? And the, the market's going to dictate all of that, but that that's our idea, just if you guys are thinking about it, how to do it. And then I'm giving the the victory home system away basically to anybody who wants to do it and say whatever your market dictates your market dictates if you are willing to do it just go do it and that's that's yeah. really that, that kind of yeah model. absolutely and another revenue model is training like actual apprenticeships training. or education like instead of going to college you take this uh, much more applied school where it's about how do we solve pressing world issues through collaborative design that's the best product that I would love to see. Um, wish I had that accessible to myself. And that's why I'm doing this because I felt that my education was getting me farther down the rabbit hole and being useless. So I think we can transform society uh, by this. And it's, yeah, uh, some mind shifts necessary for that. Yeah. What has been your, uh, what has been the biggest hurdle in this process for you? I think people, I, I call it collaborative literacy, people understanding the possibility that this actually exists. 
one that even open hardware exists. Like most people don't know what that is. Um, so it's the cultural mindset of collaboration that a lot of people think that they collaborate, but they don't. Like, I think people don't grab, grasp around the idea. Like when we published the brick press or the 3D printer, it's like we, we thought that, oh, all these people are going to just start businesses around it. But somehow the entrepreneurial guys, they don't. And I think that is a lot because they think, oh, well, you got to have proprietary IP to, to actually come out ahead. I think a lot of it is cultural. It's, it's people do not really collaborate. Uh, that's, that's what I would say. So the technology works. I don't think it's technology or like, can you actually build it as good as John Deere or Intel? That's not the question that you have to get there. But once that knowledge is available, just like what happened with 3D printers, nobody did them until that completely exploded around 2000, what was it like 2010 or something? The rep once rep. The patents went, once the original patents went out of yeah. um, existence, and then Baker Bike came along and um, everything yeah. else. Yeah, rep rep. I, I think it was, yeah, like the patents ran out, like what year was that? I, I forget what it was, around maybe like 2008 or. Uh, rep rep project started and the whole industry like right now the entire I would say pretty much the entire 3d printer the, the consumer industry on that it's all derivatives of the rep rep project so there's still the big guys and they have some market share um, but yeah the whole industry came up came out of that with the rep rep project so uh, that can definitely work it, it does work people are not um, really aware still that that kind of possibility exists and, and unfortunately like with RepRap uh, I think uh, RepRap was a great milestone showing that open hardware can scale quite a bit um, but I think we've got a long way to go long way in terms of because uh, collaborative enterprise design that definitely not part of that equation like the guys who are doing the big companies like Prusa um, or others I mean they're not sharing their enterprise there's none of that kind of active dissemination of enterprise know-how that I think could be very useful because I mean Prusa the latest I heard is that they're actually buying up other companies now instead of innovating it's like well that's what you get to after a certain time I don't know either great fucking stuff their documentation is spot on like I just built a Prusa printer yeah three weeks ago yeah they're whatever else is going on they're doing things right and yeah way. nobody else I can see is just Doing it. Yeah. Now, how open source are, is everything? How you know, there's, there's some of the questions there, but I gotta say they're they're doing the cases work. Yeah, they're they're good. Also, they're spending money for it. Much more expensive than other options, but much better than other options. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. So um yeah, so one revenue model is workshops teaching people how to build things, uh like brick presses, 3D printers, greenhouses. Um, yeah, and this is this philosophical question um, that Linux won the battle but kind of lost the war because um, you can say that Linux is a, it's the most amazing thing. It's, it succeeded. Every, every company uses it. But um, yeah, the promise of distributing wealth has not, not really happened yet. Um, there is an open kernel in Linux. Uh, everyone builds proprietary, proprietary applications on top of it. That's cool. Um, but it's still, yeah far from the promise of, of distributing productive power far and wide to everybody. And that's why hardware is, I think, much more potent than Linux. Like we, we can actually win this war here, if you call it that, with hardware because it's so tangible. It meets such fundamental needs. So even if you look at the word to make a living, well, what's that mean? What keeps you alive? It's some hardware, it's food, it's a house, it's a car very basic things. If we can access um, openness at that very basic level, wow, the potential there is so much bigger for, for change. That's it's definitely there. Just like Linux, uh, just like uh, hardware is much, much harder than software. The potential there is that much greater for good or evil. <laughs> it can go either way. You can go, you can have paradise, you can have misery. It's up to us. And it's always been uh, like that, except technologically, it is very easy for one way or the other. Like, well, at least prosperity. Well, the good side, 
there's technological access for the good side to win hands down right now for everybody to be prosperous. Oh yeah, and, and the scarcity, the scarcity stuff, we have just the basics, first principles. We've got 10,000 times more power from the sun that comes, that comes from the sun to us than we use, even in today's modern wasteful economy. There's no case for scarcity. There's abundant materials. Um, yeah, it's, so it's like back to the answer of why is this not happening? It's mindset, it's people's awareness, just kind of <clears throat> tuning into the possibility out there because open source hardware does not exist. It's like tiny, tiny, one thousandth of one percent about. Um, it's, it's like nobody has heard about it. Software has succeeded. Um, yeah, I mentioned about. Um, here, here was some of the things like some data on. Oh, yeah, like. So Gini coefficient is an important one. Uh, that's that that's a measure of how how well wealth is distributed. And uh, yeah, it's worse now. It's uh, it should be falling falling down. Like closer to zero means that um, everyone has equal wealth, whereas one means that one person in the entire planet has all the wealth. We're at about like 0.6 or 0.7. There's definitely like that that tra that thing right there, the the wealth thing. Uh, in 2017, apparently there were eight billionaires that had half the world's wealth. That's um, yeah, that's that's definitely a, an issue. Um, free free hardware. Um, now the founder of free software kind of he doesn't really like hardware. He doesn't think it applies to open source applies to hardware. But I don't agree with that because it's hard. <laughs> uh, because copying hardware is so hard, the question of whether we're not allowed to do it is not vitally important. Well, it's critically important, but I did mention it's harder. It is definitely harder, but why isn't it more important? It's much harder and much more important at the same time. Um, we don't have automatic copiers for hardware. Well, you can debate that too. There's digital fabrication, right? So... History of Freedom 101, slavery abolished in 1965, Linux in 1990, natural capitalism 1999, open source economy. That's the next step. That's the next 100 peace, peace prizes to get there. Um, tipping point of hardware, uh, rough calculations, kind of back of the envelope thing. I'm thinking um, if we get to 1% of open hardware, there's like a tipping point. And how do we get that? Tipping point, yes, this is actually like a little math and you can play with this, but does this make any sense? So tipping point is, occurs when 10% of the population uh, do something. Now, 30% uh, of the world is hardware, uh, i.e. the rest is the service economy and information economy. And then salaries are 40% of GDP. So if you take that times 1 trillion, those percentages, 10% times 30% 30, times 30%, times 40%, why do I say salaries? Because salaries are what people do for a living. This is like what we do every day, right? So if people are doing about 940 billion, those percentages of the entire economy, um, which is about 100 trillion. Um, current economy is about 100 trillion. Um, multiplying that by 100 trillion, you get like a 940 billion, about a, tr a trillion. So it's like, we're just gonna get to a trillion, like about 100. <laughs> That's all. Um, yeah, agrarian industrial to information economies. Uh, now we're going more into the experience economy. I think this digital fabrication, upskilling of people, a human machine collaboration gets us more into the experience economy. Um, I think as, as basic needs are met, people are looking more for experience, uh, experiences to make their life meaningful. Um, but I, I'd say the good experience is being connected to the natural life support, support systems that support us. So it is about productivity and that connection to making things, it's very human. It's like, I don't think we'll lose it anytime soon. Uh, but what is the open source economy? It's where people, like you have a company, like, you know, what is it? When have we gotten there? I think it's when companies go to a common pool of knowledge and then uh, it's distributed knowledge and there's many more companies, but that's the norm. It's like, you don't have to go file for a patent. You're actually getting better stuff because everyone's contributing to that. And 
theoretically that's obvious, but nobody does that. So once again, it's like a cultural thing. Like, okay, why don't we do that? Scarcity mindset, maybe our uh, reptilian brain freaks out before we, you know, because uh, technology has increased so fast, the br human brain is lagging behind. This possibility, but our body thinks, our minds still think that we're in scarcity mode, fight or flight. So we need some human evolution here. Just to hit that hammer home, in my community, um, they pull up and repave the roads rather than simply there's a new methodology where you can simply uh like skim and then put a, a small layer on and it lasts twice as long will yeah. save you uh i think it's seven times more money but because it's novel they refuse to do it even though they'd save seven times more revenue because their road guys know how to do one road thing right you gotta rip it all up plop it all back down rather than using a no, no, the novel technology, skim, redo, and then, you know, allow for a better citizen experience. Cause that's what we're talking about here is better citizen experiences. Yeah. You know? So what you're saying is, I mean, there's a lot of industrial inertia. Like that's why we do want a world of entrepreneurial startup as opposed to huge centralization. Cause the, I mean, in the book called small is beautiful by Schumacher, uh, that's a seminal book that says that after a certain scale of organization, things start to break down. Uh, and one of those breakdowns is the inertia that you've got all this investment into some kind of infrastructure. You're going to milk it for as long as you like. You don't care if it's, uh, if something is better, you try to snuff out the better stuff. And uh, this is just, just how things work. Uh, it's kind of like inertia. That's the law of physics. It's a natural, natural law and applies to large organizations too. Um, but yeah, so, uh, we published about open source, uh, the, the concept of, Distributive enterprise. This was an in MIT innovations journal like 2011. So that word came out. Nobody knows this word, but distributive enterprise, the idea that you're sharing blueprints of the enterprise openly so that many pe people can benefit as a result, you also benefit, um, which kind of happens in Linux. Like you can call, call like the closest thing to that would be like Linux foundation where they do encourage enterprise, of course. Uh, I think we should call for a little further step where it's explicitly like incubation or startup assistance and that collaborative product development. Like, yeah, they will, like say Linux Foundation will tell you, to, will um, help you to get, to build upon all this open source code. But once you get to that enterprise level, it's competition. It's, it's solo. You're trying to beat other guys. Well, what if you were actually trying to collaborate with all those other guys. That's the idea that distributed enterprise tries to capture. You're now pooling your efforts. You've got the goods. Now let's get to where the rubber hits the road. You've got enterprise making a living. We're still killing each other at making a living. So we should collaborate on that. That's, that's distributed enterprise. Collaborative economics. Um, yeah, I don't know, but ultimately it's it's about intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation, autonomy, and mastery, and purpose drive us. Uh, it's not a carrot on a stick that drives us. So people are looking for meaning, and I I do believe uh, open source and collaboration and taking care of everybody is, is highly tied up with a lot of meaning and a lot of good energy for everybody. So uh, it's on a good side. It's the good old fight of good versus evil, and. Uh, we continue. Uh, at the end of the day, it has to turn into livelihoods and enterprises that people actually do this for a living. So part of the challenges here is that until you get the products well developed and people can support themselves, people just come and go. That's one of the challenges. So right now we're focusing a lot on the enterprise distribution and creation so we can make it happen. So if we nail this house, for example, that's a, that's a really robust revenue model that, that can bootstrap many other organizations. The idea being that collaborate, you do effective enterprise, you use that to cross subsidize world changing work. That's, that's our vision for what we'd like to do as open source ecology is create campuses all over the place <laughs> where you come in the, the, with the purpose of solving pressing world issues of which we're not short of. So that'll be a good thing. So get involved. You're here. So you are involved. That's it. <laughs>
All right. So any, any thoughts on this? Any questions or? Jacked. We got a month to talk about these questions. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we got a bunch of, and we're gonna dive right into the the build out there. So um, yeah, just to prepare. Yeah, I mean we'll we'll be talking a lot about this. So on the house front, it's it's um, yeah active build today. We do the foundation, so we're kind of like almost uh, a day ahead because we said we're gonna prepare the foundation. We kind of did that. I'm not sure is anyone gonna miss preparing the foundation? What is and, the tale? You want to do some more? Yeah. We'll, we'll have you do the next next trip. So, yeah. Well, so what we did so far was was yeah, we poured a section and we prepared like another section. There's more sections if you want if you want to uh, do some more foundation. Yeah, I mean we're just gonna be pushing creating and uh, yeah. creating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, to, for today we have a one section with rebar and all that and a like a separator thing, uh, where the truck comes in and then. People screed it, in other words, get it as flat as possible in this 14 foot by 48 section. Um, who's done that? I've done some basic, yeah. Okay, so um, so we've got some some experience on that. Idea is that with the, the screed board, we're just gonna use a two by four, that's like a two by four by 16, uh, just kind of moving it back and forth. But idea is, uh, well, we've got four muck boots, so four people could be in the mud there. When, when we do the screen, we can actually be right on the side because it's 14 wide, the board is 16. So those right. people don't have to get dirty. Uh, we're renting a uh, power trowel to level that all, smooth smooth that all off. That works really well. Uh, last time, we kind of set set up on us already. We didn't care, just take <laughs> a power trowel and just knock it down anyway. Um, it works well, it, it smooths out the concrete quite well. Um, but um, yeah, the idea is like if you're in the mud there, and so we'd like to invite you, whoever we got like four pairs of boots, unless you don't mind getting your boots uh, all dirty. But we got four four uh, rubber boots that you can put over your shoes. Uh, but the idea is the placers; those those are those little rakes. We you move it so that the people who are screening it have as easy a time, so it's near near as good as it can be at that point. So. Because moving the scree board, that's the hard, I think that's probably the hard part. I mean, all of it is hard because you're moving around this wet, he very heavy mass. Uh, so it's it's quite exhausting. The people that I think have it hard is the, the guys who are doing the scree board because you're moving against this mass of concrete. So the way to make it easy for those people is make it as close to level as possible for them. And for now, it's quite easy because we've got a clear boundary on both sides. We're going between one is the finished concrete side and the second side is the wood board where we work against that. So, so the level is guaranteed. And then after that, there's uh, there's the magnesium floats, there's floats. Uh, people can like work the edges. There's one four foot float we have. And the last step is the power trial, but you'll see it, it's 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 cool. It's uh, definitely a good skill and uh, pretty rewarding to have. Yeah, and then hopefully in a, in a year or two, we'll, we'll be making solar concrete. So that's that's our next next milestones, yeah. Uh, so the guys, those guys are coming at at 10 a.m. Uh, so we can time it for that. But we should break out of here like 9:30 to go out there and prepare. Um, introduce yourself, please. Uh, hi, I'm Mike Tenner. Uh, I'm from uh, South Carolina. Uh, I used to be a software engineer. Uh, then I went into uh, medicine. Or out of physical therapy. I've been following you for about uh, 10 years. Oh, um, cool. And yeah, I, I, I love the project and I, I've seen the hypothesis and I've built a couple of systems that are back up in New York. But, mm -hmm. so. Nice. Okay. Cool. Yeah, we introduced ourselves. Uh, and the brief. Yeah. Thank you guys. Yeah. Oh. I'm Curtis. Curtis. Uh, I'm uh, born and raised here in the States, but I've been living in Ghana the past 10 years. And my focus is on the tractors, uh, teaching people how to make tractors. Curtis is my brother. I live Michigan, Chicago-ish. Um, so I'm on the farm in Michigan, and I need to make a tiny house. <laughs> you know, they keep me warm and let um, so that I'm here in support of him, but to learn that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And Curtis, like us, he also wants to burn rock. His rock contains iron. So he's talking about in Ghana, there's uh, basically smelting steel from rocks. That's where all the wealth comes from, from rocks, sunlight, plants, soil, and water. That's pretty much it. And then we process it to the modern lifestyle. Um, should be easier than it is right now. We shouldn't have housing as the number one cost in our life. Other animals don't. Um, but that's what we're working on. Related to steel, so I saw yeah. recently Sweden's got they have something like green steel. Yeah. Is that doable I believe, yeah. on this scale? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Now, green steel comes out of hydrogen. So you split water, you get hydrogen. So idea of green steel is that you're not using coke as the reducing agent, using hydrogen as the reducing agent. But you still hydrogen, have process of heat. You have which heat, is energy heavy heat. heat. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, I, mean, but I don't can, think anything that is green that is using an exorbitant amount of heat quite yet. That, that's the concrete issue. It has to. The limestone, and that's the, I mean, or has been since my yeah. research. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely, in some, a lot of these industrial processes, there's a lot of heat involved or energy. A lot of, a lot of processes are energy intensive, but that's okay. If we've got solar energy, uh, solar panels are dropping to near zero proportions. And that is gotten from, uh, breaking apart silicon dioxide into silicon. So how do they do that? Uh, how do you take the oxygen out of a silicon atom? That's also a, a uh, high temperature process. And I believe that's, what is that? I think that's electrolysis. So you put current through that and the thing just breaks up. That's a very, very high energy process. Uh, but the raw feedstocks are very abundant and we have abundant energy still. So there's a concept of like, um, it's called Kardashev scale. Who's heard of that? Kardashev scale is the amount of, um, it, it's like when we're going to settle the universe sometime in the future, maybe. Uh, uh, Kardashev scale is how much of a planet's resource or a galaxy's, well, how much energy of the available energy you're using. So on earth, one would be that we're using all the available energy all this energy from the sun, which is 10,000 times more than we use today. But think about that. So if you start thinking from first principles, that means we can have way many more people, way more things happening on this planet. Population can probably go 10, 100,000 times and we still survive. So, but it's our choice where we wanna be. It's like, we gotta make those decisions. How do we want to develop? Do we want to like sprawl? The next hundred year hump and avoid either blowing ourselves up or frying ourselves and everything else. We do that, we should be golden. Yeah. Yeah. But you can, like, for example, if, if global warming is the thing to solve, I mean, solar energy is where right now the payback, energy payback, that means how much energy goes into building a solar panel, it's about one to two years right now. So that means after one to two years, you're getting free energy, carbon neutral carbon negative, because you're producing all that from, you're not spending anything, and it's, you're getting it from the sun. So that is absolutely not an issue. And you can think, okay, well, if I have that energy, I'll set up a plant to make more PV panels from abundant materials. So yeah, there is no, ca no viable case for scarcity if you think about it from first principles and open knowledge principles. Yeah. It's just that which is empowering. It's a big hump, though. I mean, I it's, think um, the, vic the victory home is going to be dual power, so it's going to have geothermal and solar. Mm -hmm. And I'm still not able to get the. I'm still having difficulties, and with the heat pump, to get the amount of wattage that common Americans want, right? So yeah, um, yeah, it's wait a couple of years for solar is building uh, facilities all over Ohio that are due for 2023. They're shooting for six megawatts a day of solar panels and thin film. Oh, wow. Very cool. Yeah, and the question is, like, how do we get from from here to there? Well, I think it does start with mind shifts. So people yeah. have to see the possibilities and then act on it. Like, don't act from an assumption that we have scarcity and only I can, you know, the pie is finite. You know, also, you want to be careful about... Uh, 
I mean, I would say like, um, you always have to be keep your wisdom around you because you, yeah. Um, even, even if, if we have, take it off, we don't. Even yeah, <laughs> that's well, true. <laughs> even if we have like unlimited resources, as soon as you start wasting them, yeah, you still, you know, people are unhappy and people are left out. So it's all you always have to keep the wisdom around that. So ancient wisdom, modern technology, uh, put it together, make it work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. How about the schedule for the whole summer? Schedule of the summer acts. Yeah. Okay. That would be a good one. I like the thing. <laughs> hey, sorry about my phone. I don't know what the fuck I was doing. I was trying to like make it not be a annoying as shit. But so the schedule for what what we plan on is we can look at the calendar of events right here, right here. So, well, let's start with. Can I zoom in a little bit on that? So we're actually going to do day one. Uh, we're going to go straight to foundation. In this version, like painting, staining, spraying. Now we don't have to do that yet. We'll do that at the end. That we we did it all pre pre painted. It gets messed up through the whole process. It doesn't work. Uh, so we're this is this was based on the old model. So no, we're going to do that later. Um, wall modules like they yeah go ahead. I, mean, I was just going to say, uh, did you guys think about double tarping it or anything beforehand? Because, I mean, working with concrete once it's enclosed, dust is going to become a significant issue, even if it's open top and open. And dust open roll it. What do you mean, like? I, I'm assuming we're going to, like, uh, for, for the concrete, take, like, buff it and then yeah, paint it or, or something like that. Uh, we're going to do a little buffing on it. But what what's the issue on that? I would assume uh, dust in an enclosed Oh yeah, uh, space, which um, is the normal reason why it's usually done like kind of out in the open before uh, other things are put around. Yeah, it. so so the way it works right now, we have uh, the house that we're going to build here, which is pretty much a quick run through the entire frame. So we've got the entire framing, a foundation there, skin, structure, floor, roof, uh, doors, windows, skin, water, water barrier. We're gonna leave it at that and kind of decorated. It's got a decorative trellis at the end. Roof is the EPDM flat roof, uh, which is not flat. It's sloped four inches. Uh, then we're gonna to go to the CD home two, which has already it's already standing, and we're gonna work on the the all the interior finishing there. So like electrical, bathroom, pl plumbing, and uh, stairs and things like that. Um, so we have actually two two places we're going to be working on. Now this one, we're actually going to recycle. We're going to take it down at the end of the day, and we're going to use that as our as our training model that we keep rebuilding, like probably every quarter uh, for uh, new workshops. And by the way, we want to guarantee that you absolutely learn what you need to build your own. So you're actually invited uh, tuition free to the next one if you feel like you've got more to learn. So we want you to learn. Uh, whatever you need. Uh, so yeah, if you don't think this is adequate, because I mean, in two weeks you can only do so much. Like if you have no experience, you'll you'll get a feeling of the process. If you if you're experienced in building, yeah, you'll definitely like crank out the whole house, no problem. But there's a lot of systems in there, uh, so each one is a you know like quite an education. So we can only do so much. Uh, but with the documentation, like documentation, like we're gonna redo the documentation for this newer model. Uh, hopefully you can get involved remotely on that using FreeCAD that will teach you and stuff like that. Um, so we're going to be working in two places, the whole thing, up to PV, uh, carport, cabinets and trim. I mean, yeah, just everything. Um, now, after that, aquaponic greenhouse build. We'll do what we did before, but we're going to build upon it. So how are we going to build upon it? We're going to add a biodigester and we're going to go for closed loop black water. How about that? Is that crazy? Blackwater. Is that like a uh, recirculation? Sure. Uh, yeah. That, so that's uh, that's actually wastewater from the house. So we're gonna oh, do okay. a little. Right now we actually have a biodigester in the current CD home one, and that gets it down to where uh, it's a two tank system, but it processes all the waste, so it's fertilizer what comes out of it. Well, black, why don't it's like just black yeah, sink and toilet? We got that feeding into it. 
Uh, so we're going to do this. We can do that, and we're going to we can install those elements for for the biodigester worm towers. Like we know how to do worms and greens and some other things. So we'll put in all of that with a fish, and we're, and we're going for like a more modular system. We're not gonna we're gonna use the same pad foundation there, so we're gonna build the structure, the glazing, uh, but use more modular tanks. I.e., like we're not gonna dig with a backhoe on the concrete. We're gonna leave that and build on top, so a two foot depth of a wood framed kind of a pond, which is more modular, still retain the height, so you, you get the vertical growing. Um, put fish in there. So that's 15 through the 19th. 20 through the 20 seconds of the 3D printer build. Uh, the thing I want to emphasize about this and also the house is we're going to work together on that. As in, when we build the modules, we're going to do the same step. Like, because there's going to be like 10 or so of the same modules. We'll all build the same one. That's the only way you can do it to so someone can actually quality control. If everyone's at different places, it doesn't work. So that's applicable to the house, also to the 3D printer, definitely to the 3D printer. We're going to do like one step, maybe 15 minutes. Everyone gets finished with that step. First person that's that's done helps other people. And so that's some collaboration. It's meant maybe a different mindset for some people. But that gets the best results. And everyone gets finished. No one gets left behind. And, and the people who do it faster get to help. And the people who are slower uh, don't be shy to ask. So that's kind of culture building. We want to work it together like that. Um, then the tractor build 23rd through the 29th. That's going to be, we're going to put uh, several power cubes on it. I think we promised four, and we can do that. Um, but it really depends on how many people we have that are actively engaged at, um, and we can get as ambitious or lower things as needed. We, may, we can go anywhere from one to four power cubes. We're modular, so we definitely can build a simple frame, loader, cab, drive unit power cubes and that can all go in parallel and that's how you you actually get to the the rapid speed of build um which if you actually look at the numbers if you look at the most uh the largest tractor company these kinds of numbers where you have like five days or so we have to have actually done it in like uh two or three days for a 75 horsepower tractor that we used for doing the nut planting uh, we built that in like two or three days with four guys. That was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, the rate of production, like how how fast you can build it, is competitive. This this stuff can work, especially if you have digital fabrication, CNC torch table where you're cutting parts. Not sure where the torch table is going to be on that part. We don't necessarily need the torch table for the tractor build, as we're largely going to depend on on the box beam tubing that which, that we already have, the four by four inch square tubes, which are all already all CNC cut with a hole. So you got one inch, one inch holes every four inches, makes it easy. But actually we, one of the things we found out is you do, you do want to do some welding because if you do a cube that's XYZ bolts, you get to a lot of uh, space conflict and thing. Uh, it's actually one thing we learned is that for a power cube, we don't want to do the XYZ bolted bolted frame. We want to weld it. Some places you do want to weld. Other places you want to keep things modular. So you can learn about that. So that's that's month one. Uh, crazy. And then we focus on the CNC machines and plastic recycling. Large 3D printer. Yeah. So we're going to scale up with the axes like you see back there. They're just eight millimeter. We're going to do one inch rods, four by four by eight. Wow, that's pretty pretty chunky. Mm. Um, eight feet. Full metal printer. That means we're going to attach a welder head instead of the printer nozzle, the plastic nozzle. We're actually building the torch table October 7 through the 10th. So this is when we definitely have the torch table. Then filament maker, plastic shredder. Um, how do you do a filament maker? Heater bands, one inch auger, one inch pipe, and a drive motor and a controller. The modular way we build, we can use the identical 3D printer controller to control this uh, filament maker. So we use a lot of this modularity concept. Uh, for a shredder, uh, that would depend on a torch table to cut the blades with. And we're going to keep it simple. So we're going to drive. It's going to be a dual shaft counter-rotating design. Simplest way, attach a motor to each. 
you've got power cubes, you've got powerful hydraulic motors. Each hydraulic motor is like the one we're going to use costs like 180 bucks. That's um, so you got like 360 and drive power, but you got industrial grade strength there for like uh, at that level, you'll be at probably like, I don't know, tens of tons per day. I mean, this is industrial. So uh, drive it by a power cube. Um, so we'll do that. Uh, half inch blades, serious. Size those up to one inch or two inch, which the CNC torch table can cut. Make yourself a rock, sh rock crusher, metal shredder for recycling. So uh, all this here can be scaled up. Uh, the basic design principles can be scaled up. You have to do a little bit of calculation, know a little bit about PSI and basic structural engineering, but it's good. Uh, so the second half of October, machines flurry, CNC machines. So we've got the access to the one inch and possibly two inch universal axes. We'll focus largely on the one inch, um, attach all kinds of different heads. Uh, up to like saw sawmill cutting head. We can do the gantries up to, we did the rebar truss, which now allows us to scale our axis to 20 foot lengths. Um, that works great in terms of strength for a lightweight, low cost structure. We're gonna do um, things like router, multi-head 3D printing. So we can add, add several printer heads for production printing. What else do we say there? Um, definitely between milling, drilling, and lathing, we can attach uh, heavy rotors to the axis system. If you want to do any kind of serious work, then we'd have to start with a two inch rods for a two inch universal axis. On a two by two inch axis, you can still get about, um, about a half a thousandth deflection upon 200 pounds of force it's pretty good if you understand that uh, but the two 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 inch axis gets you to do that so that's getting into heavy contact machining uh, on the one inch you get to lighter contact machine like cnc torch that's non-contact printers and torch tables are non-contact you can do say like i don't know three by three gantries for small light duty milling Kind of thing with a one inch axis but for heavy duty you got to go to two inch and three inch at that point we'll build as many as we can uh, what what do we decide what kind of head do we want to put on it do you want to maybe continue with the welder head and start perfecting the, the wire arc additive manufacturing the three the metal 3d printing uh, it's up to us there um, and then a uh, month three is on a heavy machine so um there's, there's a section of November 1 through 7th on a 3D printer product development. So we're going to do pl print a lot of different things like things like bearings or, or belts. And uh, it was intended to be product development where we're actually exploring making different mixes. We've got a bunch of different pellets or stuff we're going to just throw into the grinder to grind, like old PVC, old prints. We could explore making uh, formulas for filament. So... I mean, 3D printed product development, one thing that could happen is, I mean, to get printer filament, that's pretty much from trash. That That's a big deal. Because that way you can solve, like with the housing and applies to, we can start printing. Like, okay, so I mentioned the four by four by eight printer for what? For the house panels, other building materials. So that's, that's where we're going to. Uh, how far we get? I don't know. How far are we gonna get? So we do have the ability to build frames of any size. We have universal controllers, larger stepper motors. If you think about a single belt drive on a stepper, working strength is 50 pounds. Um, that's decent without any gear down, like not talking any gear downs yet. So we've got controller frame axis capacity to do just about anything. So what we do with it is, is about how quickly we all learn to put them together and how they work. So. So it's a lot, uh, I mean, we can innovate here. It's where we kind of put our brains together. Uh, we don't have like a hundred people here. We only have a dozen or two. And the second part is gonna be a total of a dozen people, like actually nine people on site through the whole program. First month is like heavier, but yeah, we still don't have like too, too many people, but we'll see what we can do. Um, we kind of like the, the way it turned out um, regarding this, like because of COVID, we were like, weren't sure like what's gonna happen. So we kind of didn't really push the publicity a lot. Um, so we don't have too, too many people, but we do have a nice 
core crew that we can do do a lot with. Um, so soil condition. Oh yeah. So CB press build those three days. We're going to build and run and probably make some walls for the the pad that we have over there. Um, soil conditioner build. Yes, that's the missing link to to affect the production. If you want to do stabilized block, you can do unstabilized straight out, but just with it like a rototiller or whatever. If you want to do stabilized, you do want to do a soil conditioner that doses a certain amount of cement in a regular, very controlled manner. So we'll, we'll prototype that. And then grand finale, about two weeks of big tractor build. So what are we saying there? A bunt like eight power cubes. Just snap them, snap them all on. It, we know how to do that. Uh, the way we do it actually is we, we use one uh, mother power cube, which has got the hydraulic reservoir, cooler, filter, and then each then individual motor pump units. And that's how we can keep it manageable. So we can use like turn on one of them, turn on all eight of them. So we'll play with that. Um, yeah, one mother and three. Well, actually one mother and then four, four babies there because we'll just keep the, the hydraulics part cooler and all that uh, to keep the part that breaks like the engine is the part that fails. So keep that separate and small and manageable. So if it breaks, actually take it out right by hand, snap a new one in, zero down, downtime, downtime. So that's the idea. Hey, but we gotta quit here because the concrete's arriving soon. We gotta get ready. Yeah. So everybody, um, get to stop, uh, get to the site. There's some equipment there. Um, yeah. Let me ask. You, let me ask you a quick question. A lot of us are tech savvy, is there a balance between how much technology, meaning um, things that